Hey everybody, Dr. Spear here. I uh, just found a really cool new tool for ArcGIS that allows you to calculate home ranges for fish and I want to share it with you so let's go ahead and take a look. Alright, so let's start talking about uh, calculating home ranges for fish and other aquatic organisms. Uh, just recall that we define a home range for uh, an organism as the area it uses frequently and within this is the core range which they use a lot. Now there are more exact definitions but you understand that we have both this home range and this core range concept. And it's really easy to calculate these using GIS. Most of the time we use the geospatial modeling environment uh, to calculate these home ranges. And this works really well for terrestrial organisms, but the techniques that are out there don't always work as well for aquatic organisms, and that's why we're going to talk about doing these for aquatic organisms today. Now, the techniques we talk about today aren't exclusive to aquatic organisms. In fact, they will adapt well to make uh, home ranges for terrestrial organisms more accurate and more exact. <clears throat> Excuse me. But what we're going to show is how these uh, techniques that are used for terrestrial organisms can be slightly modified to give you a better idea of the home and core ranges for a fish. So there are three big problems that we're going to address today. And the first is that the fish are restricted to the water, obviously. Uh, and this is a problem because a lot of the home ranges that we do extend out of the water. I'll show you an example here in a second. Another problem is that we have, often we have a lot of time elapsed between locations and that can influence the results for your home range. And finally, the path that's traveled from point to point can vary depending upon different conditions. And these are three things that we're going to address today. So let's talk about the first. Typical techniques if you extend the home range onto land if you apply them to aquatic organisms and that's a big problem with using things like the geospatial modeling environment. So as an example, take a look here at some fish locations. This is in part of the Mississippi River and you see we've got several locations. We've got an island with a side channel. We've got a dam here. And if you're just eyeballing this, you can kind of get an idea of say the home range and the core range. Um, you kind of get the feeling that you could sort of define this as the home range for this particular fish and the core range would be something like this, right? <clears throat> but whenever we apply um, the geospatial modeling environment and calculate a home and a core range for this fish we get some results that we don't like very much. Now first just a little review here here's the results from the geospatial modeling environment and you see that we're going to call the 90 percent isopleth the home range the purple areas and <clears throat> think of these isopleths as um, a probability distribution and so the way I think about it is there's a 90% the probability of finding the fish within the purple area. Uh, another way to think about this is if you go out 100 times looking for this fish, 90 of those times it'll be somewhere in the purple area. And then the core range will define as the 50% isopleth with the same idea that of those hundred days you go out looking for the fish, 50 of them it's going to be found within this blue area. And of course the blue area is a subset of the purple area. Okay. Well, you can see some problems here. When we apply this type of uh, kernel density estimate for the home range, and that's because the home range extends up above the dam, which we're pretty sure is a barrier to this fish's movement. And more importantly, it extends onto land, which we know is a barrier to the fish's movement. And so that's the first problem that we want to address. Now, usually, if we use these traditional techniques and get a home range and a core range like we just did, we'll just go ahead and use a, a polygon of the 
aquatic environment and clip them and just get rid of those portions that are unavailable to the fish. And so if I do that, <coughs> excuse me, you see, you get the results here. And so now we have them confined to the river, but they're not quite accurate because you remember those big portions that we just clipped away. It's calculating the home range and the core range as if there's no barrier, but there is a barrier. And so the calculations are going to be influenced by the fact that there is a barrier here. So what we need to do is modify our technique to acknowledge that the shoreline is a barrier. And the nice thing is there's a new arc tool called Fish Tracker, and it was developed by Laffin and Taylor. And I just found this online, and um, super. the authors are super nice, and they helped, helped me when I first started playing with it, and helped me work through some troubles I had with it. But it seems to work pretty slick. And this new art tool allows us to use the edge of the water as a barrier and to make more appropriate home ranges for our fish. So if you use this new art tool, here are the home ranges and the core ranges that the art tool comes up with. And you see that they're pretty similar to the ones that I drew by hand earlier. And they definitely seem to be appropriate based upon the distribution of these points. And so by using the river's edge as a barrier, you can see how the, sh the shape of the home range is modified. And it, you can consider this to be a little bit more realistic. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, this is using the KDE, or kernel density estimate method, for determining the home range. All right, well, that's excellent. So how does it do this? How does it calculate the home range by and use the shoreline as a barrier? Well, to address that, um, let's talk about some of the other problems with aquatic home ranges and see how they all come together to develop this fish home range. And so that's the next thing I want to talk about is the time elapsed between locations. Most of the time you're going to go out and get several locations for each fish, but of course there's going to be time that elapses between those locations. And can we use that time elapsed in order to modify our analysis a little bit? Usually this time the time between location varies. And sometimes we just ignore the fact that there's time between locations. And so two points that differ by only a day or two are treated the same as two consecutive points that differ by a month. And so that can happen sometimes. Sometimes we weight the analysis based upon how close in time consecutive points are to one another. And so if points are taken closely to one another, those, contain, those maybe contain a little bit more weight than a point that's taken a month later or vice versa. So there are methods for taking the time between location into account, but a lot of times we just sort of ignore that. Well, let's look at a crude example here to see sort of what we're doing with this new arc tool. So we've got four locations of this fish. And so let's just pretend that's the first location, the second, the third, and the fourth. And the first, the time between the first and second is just a day. The time between the second and third is just a day. And the time between the third and fourth is five days. So let's look at the fish moving from point one to point two. Now we don't know exactly how the fish moved from this point to that point, but we do know how long it took. We knew it took it a day, right? So we can assume it swam in a straight line at a constant rate. Now, did the fish likely swim in a straight line from point one to point two, and did it likely swim at a constant rate? Well, probably not, but who can say that it did or it didn't? Right? That's ultimately the limitation of any tracking study you're going to do. You're limited by how often you get locations on an individual. And of course, always more locations is always better. Uh, more locations and more fish 
always make for a better study, but there are always going to be limitations, right? And so since we don't have any data to contradict the fact that the fish swam in a straight line at a constant rate, we're going to go ahead and assume that it did. Keep this in mind when you interpret your results. So <clears throat> if that fish swam from point one to point two at a constant rate, we can create some theoretical pseudo locations along this straight line. So for example, when the fish swam from point one to here, we know that this is on a straight line to the final destination, and we know it took about a fifth of a day, and then another fifth of a day to get here, another fifth of a day to get here, another fifth of a day to get here, and then finally 24 hours later, we're here. Again, is it likely that the fish swam exactly like this? No, but it's the best we can do given the data that we have. And that's what we're saying here. It's our best guess at where this fish was during those 24 hours. So another argument to do it this way is, is do we have to ignore the fact that the fish actually swam from point one to point two? We know it had to get from point one to point two somehow. We know it had to swim there somehow. We know how long it took. Why not use this information to try to make our analysis a, a, a little bit better, okay? But again, always remember that these are some of the assumptions that are built into this technique. And I want to make sure that you understand all these assumptions and all this reasoning so that you understand the limitations of this kind of analysis. Any type of analysis we do, we're going to have to make choices, and any type of analysis we do is going to have some underlying assumptions. We need to make sure that we understand those so that we can understand our interpretation of the results. So if we extend this logic to all the other points, we see that we have a higher density of pseudo locations between the last two points since there was a longer time between those locations, but very little distance between them. And so given that we don't have any other contradictory information, we can say that uh, we're going to assume that the fish just stayed in that area for those last five days. Now, did the fish move elsewhere during those five days? Probably did, but again, we don't know one way or the other, so we're going to have to assume that it just stayed there. Realize that in any type of home range analysis, you're already making this assumption uh, implicitly, if not explicitly. So that assumption is already sort of built in. We're just kind of stating it explicitly here. So. Since you're going to have so many more of those pseudo locations in that small area, that might give those points there a little bit more weight and then more influence when you calculate a home range from these points. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be that way, but you can assume that it's going to give those points a little bit more weight. And so therefore the home range is probably going to be drawn more uh, around these points and treat this point over here as more of an outlier. Also understand that if we ignored the time between points, we're already going to give these three points a little bit more weight because the kernel density estimate gives points more weight due to their clustering. That's sort of the idea behind the kernel density, is that when you have them close together spatially, that they're going to contain a little bit more weight and it's more likely to draw the home range around those points. So it already had, was going to give those some weights now we're also going to influence that weight because of the time between locations as well. <clears throat> so another way to think about this is to ask, well, how would things change if the time between locations changes? That might change the weight of fish locations, and it might influence the way you interpret your results. So this time, same points, but pretend that it takes five days to go from point one to point two and then five days to go from point two to point three, but then only one day between the third and the fourth. Now, if you think about that, that's going to change your idea of the home range of this fish, right? Because it, it was <clears throat> several days later that it was down here, and then several days later it was up here. Again, it's very possible that the fish swam down quickly and swam back up and we just missed it, but we don't know that. 
It's also possible that the fish spent a lot of time down here and not much time up here. There was only one day between these locations, so you might not have as much information there. There are different ways you can interpret this. Well, if it took that kind of time, then you're going to have more pseudo locations and a higher density of them between the first and the second because it took longer to get there. And so this point out here might carry more weight this time. Again, these are the assumptions of this technique and you've got to keep them in mind when interpreting results, but any type of home range analysis or movement an analysis is going to have similar kinds of assumptions. Now future versions of the fish tracker tool might include a factor that weights the points according to their time more explicitly. And so if there's been a long time between locations, it might de-weight those points because there's less information there. So it might work the other way from what I just described. So there's different ways to look at the points when there's a lot of time in between them and future iterations of the tool might include that. So it's something to think about as you're working with these data. <clears throat> now the final thing we need to talk about now is the path that that fish travels to get from point to point. We've talked about the time it takes to get there, but exactly what is the path that the fish uses to get there. Now, most home range techniques are going to assume the animal travels in a straight line from location to location. Again, that's what we just talked about, and in the absence of contradictory information, that's the best you can do. But of course, you probably guess that this is not always true. In real life, animals likely move along what's known as the least cost path. And so, although they can't always, they, they probably don't have an idea of the entire journey they're going to, to cover, they do know from where they are now, what's the easiest way to get to the next point and the next point and the next point. So each time they're going to choose the least cost to move from one point to the other, and that ends up being the least cost path to get from one point to another. So let's look at a different example here. Here we've got another fish, and it's another spot in the river, and we've got some locations at the head of an island and at the tail of an island. And we want to look at how the fish moves between these locations. So again, a lot of techniques are going to assume a straight line travel from one to the other. But we said we did that in the last example when we were talking about the time and making pseudo locations between one location and another. But we also said at the start of this discussion that we're constraining the fish's behavior to the river. So let's put these ideas together and come up with a least cost path to get from one location to another. And the fish tracker tool is going to do this. So if we run the fish tracker tool, it's creating a bunch of these pseudo locations. And you see that the fish tracker tool determined the easiest or the least cost path is through the side channel, which kind of makes sense. You see it's a short distance and it's an easy swim from the two points at the head of the island through the side channel down to the three points at the tail of the island. And so in this way we're sort of combining the first two concepts in that we want to look at the time between locations and create these pseudo locations. However, we also want to make this more realistic and confine it to the river. And again, this is something that's not necessarily unique to just aquatic organisms. Terrestrial organisms could use this too. For example, let's say that this island was a mountain or a lake or some impassable object to a terrestrial organism. Well, then you would have the same kind of problem. The organism is not going to take a straight line from one point to another. It's going to take the least cost path to get from one point to the other. So once you have that least cost path, then the fish tracker tool is going to use that and those pseudo locations to create the, the kernel density estimate of home range and core range. And so that's the basic idea behind this fish tracker tools. It's going to 
take these locations. It's going to use the time between them to create pseudo locations using the least cost analysis. And then that's what's going to be used to calculate the home range. And <clears throat> at the same time, you're using the river as a mask. So you're constraining the whole analysis to the river and you're getting what could be considered a more realistic idea of the home range and core range for this fish. Now, here's the really neat thing, is that you can modify the cost and see how that modifies the home and core ranges for your organism. For example, what if that side channel is really shallow or the side channel dries up most of the year? then it's not going to be the easiest way for that fish to get from the head of the island to the tail of the island. And the fish tracker allows you to model the relative cost of travel through different parts of the water. Some areas might have a higher cost or a higher friction than others. And for example, if the water's too shallow, if the velocity is too high, if there's too many predators. So there's many reasons that a fish might not want to use What's not, what's this, there, there, you might have the, the straight line or the shortest um, actual distance might not be the least cost. It might be too difficult to swim through. And so you can model that using this tool and you can see how that's going to change the path that the fish is going to take. And that's also then going to influence your idea of home ranges. So if we look at the same fish and we're going to say that this side channel has a much higher cost because it's too shallow or this time of the year we know this side channel was dried up there's no way that fish swam down that side channel so we modified the cost reran the tool and this time the tool predicts that the fish will go down the side the main channel the main channel border to get to the tail of the island and so this is really cool because now you can talk about different factors that might be important to this fish and then you can see how that might change the pathway that the fish is going to take. Consequently, that's going to change the home range that's calculated because now, of course, that home range doesn't include any of the side channel because the side channel's dried up. And we can say that the main channel includes... The, the, the home range is out in the main channel more because that's where the fish needed to swim. So this is just a simple example, but it shows you the way you can use this new fish tracker tool to model the home ranges for your fish. So in summary, <clears throat> this is a new tool. Um, the, I found a paper that was published on it just now in 2013. And it's a tool that's added to ArcGIS 10.1 or 10.0, but it is open source, so it can be modified for other types of GIS software. The advantages of this tool are that it restricts the home range to the water, and so it calculates the home range as if the fish can't swim up on land, which is kind of a good thing to have. And so it makes it a little bit different than the geospatial modeling environment or the home range tools, which you would use in earlier versions of ArcMap. It considers the time between locations, and it uses least cost path analysis and combines all these things to come up with a more realistic home range. And I've gone over some of the techniques and the assumptions behind this, and so, as always, you're going to keep those in the back of your mind when you interpret your results. But uh, ultimately, this is a neat way to try to find home ranges for fish that are constrained to a river and I think it's going to be very useful. So that's the first part here. Where we're going to talk about the theory. In the next part we're going to fire up the software and we're actually going to do an analysis with this new tool and see how it works. So I'll see you in a bit.